professor here at the Center for European Studies, and it's a great pleasure to um, uh, moderate this panel. Uh, it's a very distinguished panel. Um, I'm, uh, the topic, of course, is, is the European economy out of the woods? I'm, I'm mindful of what uh, Louise Richardson said in the last panel, that um, falsehood depends on uncertainty and haste. And um, we have a topic which is fraught with uncertainty, and we're going to force the panelists to speak in haste. Uh, we've given them each uh, 12 minutes, and I'll uh, warn them two minutes uh, before. Uh, but it really is a, a, a quite a remarkable panel. I, I, to save time, um, they have very long CVs. I'll be very brief in introducing them. Uh, but um, uh, on my far right is Agnès benassi Carré. She's a professor at the Paris School of Economics. Uh, she serves as chair of the French Council of Economic Advisors. She's worked for the French Ministry of Economy and Finance, uh, and then in a variety of academic positions, including the Ecole Polytechnique. And she's a member of the Commission Economique de la Nation, uh, which advises the French uh, finance minister uh, and a member of the board of the uh, Banque de France. So uh, thank you very much for being here. Uh, uh, beside her is um, my friend Daniel Gros, who's uh, been director of the Center for European Policy Studies in Brussels since 2000. Uh, he serves as an advisor to the European Parliament. He's a member of the advisory committee of the European Systemic Risk Board and the Euro 50. A group, and he's uh, been a prominent advisor at high levels to um, many governments, including those of the UK uh, and the US. Uh, uh, to my left, uh, at least in spatial terms, is uh, Kyriakos uh, Pirakakos. Uh, he's director of research at uh, Dionysus, uh, an important think tank in uh, Athens, which is also uh, co-sponsoring uh, this uh, summit. Uh, he's worked as uh, innovation coordinator at uh, Athens Information Technology, as an advisor to the Greek uh, Ministry of Economic Development, uh, as chairman of um, Greece's uh, Institute for Youth, and he served as a member of the Greek uh, government uh, negotiating team uh, with the Troika in 2014. And then uh, uh, to his left is Mark Schiritz, who's uh, economic correspondent of uh, Die Zeit, uh, he's based in Berlin. He covers national and international economic affairs. He's written extensively about global economic architecture, fiscal, and regulatory issues. And before joining Die Zeit, um, uh, he was finance editor at the Financial Times uh, Deutschland. Thank you all very much for being here. It's really a spectacular panel. Um, I hope you're able to tell us something about the European economy in uh, 12 minutes. I think we'll go in the order in which um, I introduce people. So uh, we'll start with Agnes. No, there is fine. Uh, make sure that you're speaking to the microphone. So, is is uh, not sure. Peter? The mic is not working there. Oh yeah, just a sec. Okay, thanks. Go. Okay, thanks. So, well, I had a PowerPoint presentation, but uh, maybe it's not compulsory. No, um, it's coming. It's coming. So, n never mind. So. Um, we need to understand that the EU area is still in, reconstru in reconstruction, it's work in progress. And um, if, you, if you want to summarize what is happening, what has happened, we had a traditional doctrine, and you can summarize the doctrine of the EU area, the Maastricht doctrine, in two pillars. First pillar was what I would call a triple ban, uh, no bailout, no monetization, uh, no debt restructuring. And the, the second pillar was a strict macroeconomic policy assignment with the ECB in charge of reacting to aggregate shocks to the EU area and uh, national governments uh, retaining uh, uh, the ability to react to uh, idiosyncratic shocks, so shocks that uh, affect only one country or a group of countries, but not the EU area as a whole. And uh, in a sense, the EU area crisis is uh, the story of a broken doctrine. This doctrine uh, it has, uh, f has, uh, has failed, uh, lamentably. <laughs> um, uh, and the two pillars actually have failed. The first is the triple ban, uh, the triple because of the failure of the Stability and Growth Pact. Uh, so the governments were not able to uh, avoid a kind of uh, trilemma. The triple ban became a trilemma uh, because uh, you could not, if you don't have uh, if you, if you don't, oop. so, doesn't work. 
Where should I? Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Can you see past me? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> So because of the failure of the Stability and Growth Pact, uh, the triple ban became a trilemma. Uh, you cannot, at the same time, have uh, no monetization of the deficits, no uh, restructuring of the debt, and no bailout. And in a, in a sense, what we are observing uh, is a kind of uh, mixture of a little bit of monetization, a little bit of restructuring, and a little bit of uh, bailout. Uh, so, on the macroeconomic policy assignment, uh, also, uh, the, we have the rediscovered the policy mix, the need to combine monetary policy and fiscal policy in some, some specific cases, and also rediscovered policy spillovers across countries. So the, top, the, the, the question is, uh, what kind of new doctrine can be uh, built? And uh, the first uh, need is to solve the trilemma. Uh, so how to solve the trilemma? I will talk a little bit about it, uh, how to reintroduce sovereign default uh, without triggering a new crisis. Um, and the second uh, is policy coordination. Uh, in some cases, they, there will be a need for policy coordination. And here, the progress is very slim, I would say. Uh, just uh, an illustration of uh, these problems of coordination. So uh, this graph is uh, the what is called the fiscal stance, which is the variation in, in the cyclically adjusted fiscal balance of the euro area as a whole. So it, it, the bars, when, when the bars are positive, it means that there is a tightening of fiscal policy. When they are negative, it means that there is an expansionary uh, fiscal policy. And the dots are the output gap, so the difference between GDP and potential GDP. So you see 2009, it's the second uh, bar. So it's negative, and there is a negative output gap. This is the crisis, the 2009 crisis. So GDP falls below potential GDP, and uh, or many countries in the world um, perform expansionary fiscal policies, including the EU area, with an expansion of a little more than 1% of GDP. And then in 2010, the output gap comes a little halfway back to uh, the initial, uh, back to zero. And uh, still there is an expansionary fiscal policy on aggregate. And in 2011, you see that the output gap, the dot, is close to zero. And there is a very strong tightening of fiscal policy, which is not necessarily bad. The problem comes afterwards, where there is a second dip in uh, fiscal in, in, in the output uh, of, uh, of the euro area, whereas in other countries like the US, there was not such a se se second dip. There's a second dip, and the countries continue to tighten fiscal policy. They continue to adjust fiscal policy. And this is where 2012 and 2013, you see the output gap comes down, and there is still very strong tightening. And what is interesting is to, know, to understand the composition of this tightening. And uh, the gray bars, so the, the, no, so, sorry, the, the blue bars on the top are the countries uh, under programs. So they had no choice. They were under programs, so they, they tightened because they were told to tighten. Then you have the light blue, where, which were Spain, France, and Italy, which were not under a program, but they were constrained by the Stability and Growth Pact. So according to the rule, they had to, they had to tighten, but they were not as much constraints as those under a program. And you see that it is a large part of the adjustment. But still, you have, uh, on 2012, uh, a gray part, which is quite significant, which is Germany and the Netherlands. And these countries at that time were not constrained by the European rules. Uh, Germany was constrained by its own rule, uh, and it overperformed with respect to its own fiscal rule, which is tighter than the European rule. So here we have an episode of uh, um, a coordination, coordination failure uh, because, uh, and at the same time, monetary policy was not able to react. It had uh, exhausted uh, conventional tools and uh, unconventional tools. Yeah, there was not yet uh, quantitative easing. Uh, you, you may argue that uh, maybe the ECB could have uh, performed quantitative easing earlier, but this is another story. So, um, in my view, Okay, um, so yeah. So uh, 
I, I think when we talk about policy coordination, uh, policy coordination should not happen every day or everywhere. Uh, it's very important in the EU area to keep uh, subsidiarity as much as possible. So um, fiscal coordination is not needed any, every day. It's needed when uh, monetary policy is uh, constrained by the zero lower bound or when there are strong spillovers or when there is, there could be in the future, uh, um, a trade-off for monetary policy between uh, financial stability and, uh, and uh, inflation, for instance. So in these cases, fiscal policy would need to be coordinated across uh, European countries. Um, however, it's very unlikely that any uh, strong coordination will, will ever happen in the, in the EU area because, uh, because governments are responsible for fiscal policy. They are elected by citizens that will not uh, be happy if one country, uh, if they deviate from what, what they have promised to their citizens. So uh, in a sense, this is not new. Uh, remember the 1990s, there was a European monetary system, which was a form of monetary coordination across countries. And it failed at the end, uh, no, it was in the 80s, sorry. It failed in the early 90s. And, uh, and then we, it was decided to move from coordination to integration. And the question today is that there is a kind of coordination of fiscal policies that doesn't work. And the question is whether uh, a part of a fiscal policy could, be, could move from coordination to integration. Um, however, there are other areas of, of, of coordination that uh, if, you, if you think that the Stability and Growth Pact has failed, uh, the other parts of coordination are, are even worse. Um, I would say. So uh, after the crisis, after the beginning of the crisis, uh, a, a new uh, process has been introduced, uh, which is the macroeconomic imbalance procedure. The idea was that Spain and Ireland had suffered from the crisis, be, be, uh, be, unless, uh, no, these countries had, uh, sorry, the, these countries, Ireland and Spain, had complied with the Stability and Growth Pact, and nevertheless, they were hardly hit by the crisis. So the idea was to, to, to monitor not only uh, fiscal imbalances, but only also non-fiscal imbalances, I would say private imbalances. And, uh, but but then, now when you look at the macroeconomic imbalance procedure, it's very wide. It covers all kinds of uh, policies, and uh, you, you very quickly get, get completely lost. So uh, uh, another idea would be to uh, streamline the, the process, the procedure, uh, to what could be called a survival kit uh, in the monetary union. Uh, when you want to survive in a monetary union, you need uh, to, uh, to a surveillance of uh, prices. You need to avoid price and cost divergences, external imbalances, debts, uh, credit bubbles, things like that. But not innovation, education, gender, uh, gender imbalances. Gender imbalances are very important, but for the survival of the monetary union, uh, uh, it's not uh, compelling uh, the relationship between the two. So uh, it would be very useful to, uh, to reduce uh, the surveillance within the monetary union to very key factors, key elements that are price divergences, credit bubbles, debt, things like that, not uh, long-term growth, which is something different. Uh, and use policy instruments at the margin, not use structural, structural um, reforms to uh, tackle uh, short-term imbalances. Um, this is not the right instrument. And also focus on, on, um, on consistency of uh, the recommendations that are given to the governments. So uh, just a few illustrations. <laughs> Today uh, we have um, different uh, coordination processes in the your area, what is the stability and growth pact, the red uh, circle, the MIP, macroeconomic imbalance procedure, uh, the, the green um, circle, and uh, Europe 2020, which is a long-term growth strategy. And they partially overlap. So uh, the same item could, depending on the country, fall under SGP, MIP, or Europe 2020. And frankly, uh, for a member of parliament, it's very difficult to understand uh, these, uh, these uh, procedures. So the idea would be to uh, clarify and separate the different processes and spell out what is the objective, what is the instrument, and what is the horizon. 
and uh, these happen to be different in the in the different processes. Yes. So uh, I am. The second thing is to ensure consistency for the EU area. So I take the case of the case study of Germany and France. Uh, it's very nice because in Germany there is a huge uh, current account surplus. In France there is a large current account deficit. Uh, so you would uh, you you would um, uh, call for a supply side policy in France and a demand side policy in Germany. Uh, stimulate demand in Germany and stimulate supply in France. So it's quite the case in France that the, so this is the, these are uh, summaries of the country-specific recommendations to the two countries in 2017. And uh, it's quite uh, apparent in France that it's a supply-side policy, but in Germany it's not so clear. And in particular, uh, this is a detail, but uh, it, it shows the inconsistency um, it was recommended to Germany to create the conditions for, to promote higher real wage growth. But real wage growth can be achieved through negative uh, inflation. Okay? So uh, implementing uh, the recommendations country by country doesn't ensure that you have a convergence between the different uh, countries of the EU area. Uh, for, and also uh, to stimulate private investment, um, cutting the costs of the companies when they have already a huge amount of savings is not very consistent. So um, I, I would uh, I, so to, to, to summarize uh, on these issues of coordination, I think that we sh if we want to um, uh, to succeed in more coordination, first we need to streamline the process, not coordinate everything every every day. Fiscal coordination today is not compelling. It was important. It would have been important in 2012 and 13. Today, it's not compelling. So uh, we should not. The Commission should not issue recommendations every day to all countries because they, they get they get nervous about it, and also not on all uh, issues. And to, to just to uh, I don't have the time the, the time to cover the three key debates today in the EU area are first completing the financial union. Uh, second, the fiscal union, and third, and third, um, uh, the national policies. How to uh, uh, how to um, rebuild uh, the rules for the countries, and how to introduce some market discipline without triggering triggering a uh, new crisis. Sorry, uh, if, I, if there are questions, I will have time to to expand on this. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Daniel Grow is next. Okay, sorry, there was a message here. Okay, good. I have understood. It's a pleasure to be here also at this summit, especially to speak after Agnes, who have given you who has given you the nice overview of the uh, framework for macroeconomic policy making in the euro area. My aim is much more modest. I just uh, wanted to point out uh, that uh, we seem to have an economy which uh, is now coming back from the woods, so to speak, and uh, in my view, unlikely to re-enter them anytime soon. So um, these are my main points. Now, what should I do here? <laughs> voila, okay. It's slow. It's it yeah, okay, good. Slow. Thanks. Now I've understood. Sorry. <laughs> um, so my main point is basically that we have a slow recovery, but one which has the advantage of, in my view, being rather solid, and that it is underpinned by one really extremely important development, which is, in my view, widely underreported, which is this trend-wise improvement in the European labor market particularly in the labor force participation rate, which indicates that uh, there are really no big discouraged worker effects. As a brand, let me say immediately, I will be talking about the euro area average. There are, of course, some outliers <laughs> and some differences, but in 10 minutes, uh, I will stick to the average, which already <laughs> is interesting enough. So um, what you see here is, I think, something that uh, Agnes referred to earlier. Uh, Ultimately, for a large area like the euro area, growth has to be carried by domestic demand. And that, of course, during the euro area crisis, collapsed. 
um, partially also under the impact of uh, the fiscal tightening that uh, Agnès illustrated. But then basically it has been hovering around 2% uh, since the, the crisis ended uh, in around 2012. So that is, if you want, the, the broad picture of where the economy is going now. And uh, the key issue is, uh, what about the labor markets? And here we see two things. First of all, I'll give you the, the, the development terms of employment. And what you see is actually that, uh, of course, the, the uh, fall in demand had a negative impact of employment, as you would expect. But it has already now recovered to the peak of 2008. Right? Whereas in the US, you see that the employment rate has actually not recovered back to the peak because there was something going on, uh, which is that the activity rate or the labor force participation rate have evolved very differently. Uh, if you take the red line here, which is the United States, you see that, uh, and that has been much discussed in the US, the labor force participation rate has actually declined since the early 2000s. Um, and there's a particular step down with the crisis. Discouraged workers, as in the textbook, so to speak. Now, if you look at the blue line, you see just a trend upwards increase, and you see no impact from the crisis. So therefore, no discouraged workers. So the idea that there are permanent scars in the European economy because of the crisis, at least for the labor market, you don't see them really. Right? On the contrary, the labor force participation rate has increased. At the beginning of the 2000s, the US was the nirvana for Europe. We wanted to have a labor participation rate like the US. And uh, actually now Europe has achieved it, but partially also, of course, because the US ha has been coming down. So on that side, I think you see a trend-wise improvement. And it means also there are, of course, still workers around who haven't, ah, right, slower, no? Yes, there we are. You see, of course, there's a difference between the employment rate and labor force participation rate. And the vertical lines indicate those who are unemployed. They're still more unemployed in Europe than the US because fewer people have left, or no, nobody has left the market. Actually, people are coming into the market. And that means there's potential for the European recovery to go on and on, right? Uh, for a few more years, whereas in the United States, uh, from now on, with full employment, the further growth can, depends on uh, getting higher productivity, whereas in Europe, there's still unemployed labor. Now, the second point I wanted to make about the European recovery is that there has been a lot of complaint about an investment gap. Right? And that comes usually in two disguises. Uh, one is you would like to have investment today to have output and employment today. And then you want to have like more investment because it increases f future supply. Right? Now, let me talk about the first one, which, of course, was one of the key issues during the crisis, whenever you have, a, especially in financial crisis, investment collapses. And then there have been complaints that investment has not really recovered fully. And there have been especially been complained about an investment gap in Europe. OK, and here I wanted to give you uh, investment as a percent of GDP in the euro area. But I take two components there. One is construction investment. And the other one is non-construction, so in machinery and equipment and so on. And what you see is that basically construction investment has actually declined. It is now about two percentage points of GDP lower than at the peak of the, of the boom. Whereas non-construction investment is actually at the same level more or less as it was during the boom years. So if you talk about an investment gap in Europe, it is basically because fewer houses are being constructed. Now, after you had a housing boom, <laughs> at least in some countries, I think that is normal. After all, housing is, um, especially in Europe, a very durable good, <laughs> right? Uh, they last for 50 and more years. And uh, therefore, once you have constructed too many houses for 10 years, there are a few years where you don't need to construct as many. So in my view, all this complaint about uh, an investment gap in Europe is misplaced. Investment in machinery, in the type of stuff which fosters future production, has actually recovered quite nicely. And the only gap is in construction. 
course, the big uh, mystery is why has construction not really taken off in Germany? Why hasn't Germany become the next Spain, so to speak? But I presume somebody at the end of the table will talk about that uh, later. Um, so as you know, until 2008, investment goes up, construction investment goes up in Spain and a little bit down in Germany. And now ideally you would have the roles inversed, but uh, all that is happening is that in Spain it's gone down and in Germany it's not really picking up a lot. It's picking up slowly a little bit, but not enough to make up for the gap. So um, if you look at investment from different point of view, by the corporate sector, households and governments, you actually don't see also a very big different, a difference. It is true that public sector investment has declined, but it is anyway in every country a very small share of GDP. And uh, Germany is much talked about. If it goes from 1.8% of GDP to 1.5% of GDP, that is not really what can make uh, a big difference. Uh, so yes, there is a case perhaps for more public sector investment, especially in infrastructure, but this is not what would really change the time path of the recovery in Europe. So uh, let me, so this is my, my outlook for the European economy, which basically says the labor markets show no permanent scars, actually going quite well. Investment also so far, and there's no sign of a let up investment. So both labor and investment uh, is doing quite, quite nicely. Um, let me conclude with this perennial scare about uh, invest deflation. Um, and here, let me just make a very uh, quick remark about what the central bank should be looking at in a time of when we have very high debt levels. In the past, in the 70s and 80s, you looked at the CPI because that is what uh, could induce, high inflation was, what could induce people to change their consumption pattern, and you wanted to avoid that. Today, you're concerned about deflation, not because people might change their consumption pattern, but because you're <coughs> afraid that debtors will not be able to service their debt, right? Typical debt deflation. But in Europe, this is not the case. Actually, it's the opposite. We have nominal GDP growth rates, which are higher than the nominal interest rate. And nominal GDP indicates the rate at which revenues for governments and revenues for corporations for the debtors actually increases. So debtors in Europe, just by sitting still, wait for nominal GDP to expand, interest rate burden grows less strongly. In the 1990s, for example, it was exactly the other way around. Then nominal interest rates were higher than nominal growth rates. So the, I don't understand the scare about debt deflation because uh, in uh, conditions, financial conditions are as favorable to debtors as they have ever been. I'm aware that some countries pay a risk premium, but even Italy, the average cost of new public debt is around 1%. The average rate of expected of increase in nominal GDP is around 2 to 3 percent, so higher. So even in Italy, um, there's no, no problem there. I leave Greece for somebody else. Um, so um, my conclusion is that this is a rather uh, strong uh, cyclical upswing which can last for a long time. Um, of course, not forever. At the end of the period when the excess labor has been mopped up, then growth rates will fall because then uh, our declining labor force uh, will come into play in Europe and the low growth of productivity will also be a break, a further break on growth. But for the time being, I could foresee that this cycle can actually last uh, for quite some time. So let me conclude with this optimistic outlook here. Thank you. Uh, so, Kyriakos, uh, Kyriakos. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm actually going to speak about the outlier, um, Greece. Um, and I will begin by the number one question that uh, international experts ask us, as coming from Greece, when we participate in such international conferences. And the number one question is uh, Ireland, Portugal, Cyprus. They all concluded uh, with one bailout. You needed three. You're still in crisis. 
Why is that? Of course, there was a different nature uh, in the other crisis, but still the question is absolutely valid to set. And it sort of justifies the old quote by Winston Churchill that the Balkans produce more history than what they can locally consume. Um, <laughs> so um, just before I focus on the, the longer term trends, which are uh, which stem from the studies that we have done at the analysis. I'm going to focus on, the, on some long-term trends that actually make us believe that, okay, we will probably exit this crisis somewhat meagerly, but there are longer-term issues that we should have into consideration. I will just make some very brief points about where we are right now. So the current program, uh, the third bailout, is supposed to be completed uh, by August 2018. Um, the whole debate is what will happen then, uh, and uh, the government... Uh, the current Greek government makes the case that we will have a clean exit. Most experts disagree with that. They feel that we will have some type of precautionary credit line uh, afterwards, a softer uh, version of a bailout. Nonetheless, what is, re what is true is the fact that macroeconomic data are actually uh, getting better. Uh, we have lost cumulatively 26 to 27 points of GDP since the beginning of the crisis. Now we're seeing meager growth rates. Um, unemployment started at 9% in 2009. It ignited to 26.6% in 2013. Currently, it's at 21%. It has dropped. Um, same with youth unemployment, which began at extremely elevated rates. It began from 20%. It peaked at 60% in 2013. Currently, it's at 42.8%. We have a primary budget surplus. All these data are correct, but nonetheless, uh, how, which, which button should? Direct it here and wait. Wait. One, two, three, four, four. Okay, is it the top one? No, no, no the, the one right. on the, the side. right one. Okay, so I'm going to focus on four um, points that have uh, stemming from four different studies that uh, worry us. Uh, the first one comes is the rise in the anti European side sentiment, and let me begin with that. Uh, it comes from a study which is called What Greeks Believe. It's an annual study conducted by the Anaeosis. Uh, we have so far measured, uh, this does take long, we have so far done three measurements. The first one in April 2015, it's the biggest belief study happening in Greece right now. The first one was in April 2015 when the incoming Syriza government was just in power. Then we had this dense political summer of 2015 with the referendum and the U-turn of the existing administration. So we felt that we needed to measure again in November 2015. And we had the third survey in December 2016. We're about to do the fourth one. And uh, this survey maps beliefs uh, in politically volatile times. And we have seen a density in belief change. And the number one uh, result had to do with, the steep, with a significant rise in the anti-European sentiment, despite the fact uh, that uh, the Syriza administration made this policy U-turn in, in Parliament and voted for the third bailout. Um, to give you, an, to give, give you two examples on this, uh, the first one is uh, the evaluation of Greece's presence in the EU as positive. Originally in 2015, 69% of Greeks, 7 in 10, replied that Greece had received uh, a positive experience, had a positive experience by participating in the EU. One and a half year later, this number had dropped to 53.5%. Um, those who are pro-Drachma, uh, originally in 2015, they were 2 in 10. In the last survey that we had, this had reached 33%, those who wanted to abandon the euro and go back to the Drachma. But we have seen this net change in a series of other metrics as well. For instance, there is also a stark level of pessimism in the survey. Uh, almost 4 in 10 believe that Greece in 10 years will not be a member of the Eurozone. Um, Almost 4 in 10 believe that it will not even be a member of the European Union. 6 in 10 believe that in 10 years Greece will not have emerged from the economic crisis. Uh, and of course, 6 in 10 also believe that uh, we will still have capital controls in place as we do. Pessimism is pervasive. Only 1 in 10 believe that the European Union will, be, will evolve into being a more unified confederation of states. Uh, if you look at the numbers, 1 in 2 believe that uh, the European Union will split with some countries withdrawing. Three in 10 believe that it will even dissolve. Um, of course, uh, pessimism is one thing. It's also matched by a couple of other uh, concerning facts. Three in 10 Greeks believe that uh, getting into a closer alliance with Russia 
would actually be beneficial uh, to their interests rather than participating in the Eurozone. And this has received lots of attention uh, by international media outlets and foreign embassies in Greece because some feel that it's indicative about uh, very problematic uh, behaviors. And also, this, I'm, I've put this in the presentation because I wanted to showcase that uh, this velocity of belief change is also uh, apparent in social matters. For instance, the majority of Greeks are currently uh, pro-gay marriage, but one and a half year ago, it was only one in three. So we're seeing this velocity in terms of belief change in other issues as well. And this is the change that you can see over there from 36 to 50.5%. To so this rise in the anti-European sentiment, I would say, is the first uh, disconcerting element. But I'm afraid that there are others as well. And this is a study that we did in extreme poverty. Actually, the author of the study is here. It's uh, Professor Matsaganis. Um, we wanted to track who are the extremely poor in Greece and how has poverty more or less evolved during the crisis. And originally, we saw the relative poverty percentage. And as you can see, it hasn't fluctuated significantly uh, between 2011 and uh, 2015 because it ma it's 60% of the median income. If the median income drops, this more or less remains uh, stable. So we wanted to see at, to look at extreme poverty and uh, with a specific methodology. Even before 2011 that you will see over there, uh, in 2009, before the crisis, extreme poverty was 2.2% of the general population. This ignites to 17.1% in 2013, and it has been dropping every single year ever since. It was 15% in 2015, now it's at 13.6%. But what's more interesting is not that number per se, the fact that one and a half million Greeks are extremely poor. What's mostly interesting is the structure of this number. Who are the extremely poor in Greece? And uh, what we found out, and I'm, I'm gonna say this, yeah. So in this slide, look at the number of those who are over 65 in 2015 who are extremely poor. It's only 2.7%. It has remained the same more or less uh, in 2016. It's one in 40. If you look at the number in the 18 to 29 category, it's 24.4%, one in four. Those who are extremely poor in Greece are basically the young. Now, if you, if, you're, if you were Greek and you were listening to public discourse about social policy in Greece, the perception of those who are poor is that it's the old pensioners, not the young. So there's this public perception that social policy should be targeted to the pensioners. And this hasn't changed even today, even though the main voting bloc of the current administration are the young which is actually extremely interesting to watch politically. Now, uh, we participate also in, a, this is the third study, we participate in an EU-wide project called COPESE, run by the University of Heidelberg, we are the Greek partner, and the one of the, it's happening in 11 countries, and one of the elements that this survey uh, includes is the fact that it has surveyed people under 35 years old and their parents in order to track beliefs. I'm just gonna mention three numbers out of the survey that were interesting to us. And this, the first one is shocking. It became a cover story in a major Greek newspaper. One in four Greeks, uh, three in four Greeks are actually contemplating the possibility to leave the country of Greeks under 35. And this number is huge. The second one, of course, more or less explains this. The primary source of income of Greeks under 35 years old is not a job. It's their families. Match those two with the extremely low levels of institutional trust, for instance, 17% trust in the domestic political system. The numbers are extremely low. We have the lowest trust numbers in the EU. So this creates a somewhat toxic mix. And the fourth and last study that I'm going to cite, and in our view, it's probably the most problematic macro trend of Greece, is demographics. So we had a population drop since the beginning of the crisis from 11.1 .1 million to 10.7 million. And this is mainly happening because of brain drain. We have lost 450,000 Greeks uh, to other European countries, to the United States. Certain people in this audience are part of this number. Um, we made a projection uh, with one of the best demographic uh, teams in, in Greece uh, about how the popu how population will evolve in the coming years. Uh, the projection is that it will, the median scenario is that it will drop from 10.7 to 8.8 .8 million in 2050. Now, keep in mind that this is the second most concerning uh, fact for us. The first one is the composition. Those who are over 65 um, are, represent 10%, they represent 21% of the population right now. They will represent up to 33% of the population then, with adverse effects in the pension system. 
also add to that the fact that the average Greek family right now have 1.3 children per couple, far below the replacement rate of 2.05, 2.1 that is necessary. Um, all those, uh, yeah, what I mentioned before. So, and 8.8 .8 doesn't even represent the worst case scenario. The worst case scenario is 8.3 8 million in, in 2050. And those were over 65, 30 to 33 percent. So uh, all of those uh, data points put together uh, have led us to believe that uh, the Greek youth represents an existential issue right now uh, for, the, for the policymakers. We're focusing too much on how to exit uh, the third program, how to exit the crisis in the short run, but we're not focusing at all on how to restructure the economy uh, in order to, to fix this. And uh, I'm going to conclude with uh, an observation made by Thomas Friedman, who came to Greece at the beginning of the crisis and wrote uh, a very interesting op-ed at the New York Times. It was 2010. And he had seen the then Prime Minister Papandreou, and he wrote this article saying that, uh, in reality, what I'm going to watch in Greece is young, educated Greece. And he concluded the article saying, if you see them coming back or staying, then probably you should consider buying a bond or two. But if you see them leaving, you should start shorting the country as quick as possible. Um, and uh, he has been significantly justified in this view because since then almost half a million young Greeks, mostly educated, have fled. So those are the stakes for us. And uh, we believe as an organization, as the analysis, that we should be focusing a lot on those types of issues as well, rather than the short run uh, crisis management. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And our, our last speaker is Mark Shiritz. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you also from my side for, uh, for the invitation. I spent a couple of months here as an undergraduate student. So it's, uh, it's really great to be back. Um, to waiting for the presentation. So I'd like to add a little um, German flavor to the debate, um, starting with, <coughs> is it coming? This is not MIT after all, you know. They're, they're <laughs> <all very fast. laughs> it's not the University of Freiburg where I studied. So, um, first of all, um, uh, to have some conceptual um, a conceptual framework, I'd like to think about your area governments, uh, government uh, governance in um, two along two dimensions, if you will. So. First, there's a centralized approach. You know, the idea is in a monetary union, you have no exchange rate uh, to adjust, to help adjusting um, in, in case of economic shocks. So you need a fiscal capacity, some sort of budget to balance out um, uh, asymmetric shocks. And you also need rules and sanctions in order to prevent member countries from free riding on this uh, possibility of being helped out in, in case of an emergency. Of course, this model then leads to more risk sharing and also to more rules and the de development of the euro area in the direction of a full statehood, um, which is more or less, I would say, the French model. This is what Macron has proposed. Um, and this is one of the uh, of the ways how to make it work. So, uh, yeah. Um, but it also has problems. Um, and this is why people are increasingly also talking about a what I would call a decentralized approach. You know, the same problem, you don't have the exchange rate. So what do you do? Um, uh, in this model, uh, national fiscal policies are there to uh, balance an, an asymmetric shock. Um, and instead of rules, you have some sort of credible framework that enables market forces to work. You know, if you misbehave, then your bond yields go up and you're forced to correct your, your course and everything works again. And this, you need, to, why do you need a framework? Because it has to be credible that actually countries that are in, in, in trouble um, are not just bailed out, but they, uh, they are forced to, uh, to, to correct. So some sort of sovereign debt resolution mechanism, banking union, um, you name it. And this model, of course, is different because it would lead, would lead to less risk sharing um, and less rules. So what do we have at the moment? Um, at the moment, we have a mixture of the two models. Oops, sorry. So we have you know, elements of the centralized approach, the ESM, the Growth and Stability Pact, the OMT, uh, measures by the European Central Bank. Um, but you also have elements of the decentralized approach, at least uh, on paper, which is a no bailout clause enshrined in the, uh, in the Maastricht Treaty. 
Um, what is the German view? Um, the German view, in theory, is be consistent. You know, either choose the centralized model or choose the decentralized model. That's what the Bundesbank is saying. That's what the Council of Economic Experts is saying. In practice, um, the German position is choose one of these models, but also make be very sure, make very sure that it doesn't uh, do anything that we don't like in, in in our country. So we like to talk about uh, debt resolution, but we don't like to talk so much about banking union completion and um, and um, any other risk sharing elements. Um, now we had elections. Um, the pre-election expectation was there will be another grand coalition of the CDU, CSU and SPD, and there will be some movement in the direction of a more of the centralized uh, version of EMU. Um, because both parties are, they don't like it, but they would be would have been um, okay to compromise. Um, but that's, of course, it played out differently. And the most likely scenario at the moment is a coalition CDU, CSU, Greens and FDP. So two parties stay the same, but uh, the others, the, the SPD is no longer there. And this has um, a lot of, or has uh, grave consequences because the Greens, the environment, Environmentalist Party, would be open to more, to a fiscal capacity, to a central um, solution, whereas the FDP, the Liberal Pro-Business um, Party, is strictly against it, um, and they just won't do it. Um, and at the same time, since uh, Angela Merkel's party has lost uh, at the elections, the share of the vote has gone down, you can also um, see a loss of authority on her side, which is important because it weakens her grip on um, the members of her, uh, her party in the parliament. So it won't be as easy as it was in the past just to force them to agree on some euro area deal because they have become more self-confident and they will, the, the, the likelihood of a rebellion is, uh, is much higher. Um, what does it all mean? Um, what can we expect um, from this constellation? Um, in my view, um, there is, it's highly unlikely that in the next four years we see a sig significant movement in terms of euro area reform. It just won't happen. Um, I know the French want it, but I don't see any, um, any possibility of Germany to agree on something substantial. Um, there will be, might be progress at the margin, you know, turning the ESM, the bailout fund, into a fully blown um, European monetary fund, as has been suggested by the Germans. This could also have some risk sharing elements additional lending facilities that make it easier to access the money that is there in, um, in the fund. But um, that is it, um, in my view. And um, you, will, you will see from the German side a focus on, um, on the decentralized approach. So not more budget, uh, away from budget, common budgets, and towards a, um, that resolution and all the other issues that, that I just, uh, just mentioned. And, and uh, 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 fourth, I think, important development is that there will be um, movement in the, euro, in the euro debate, but not on not an economic policy, not on euro area. I think as about the concession to France will be to offer from the German side more cooperation in other policy areas. You know, the border security, defense, fight against terrorism. This is what the Germans will concentrate on and in order to lead the debate away from the euro area. I found it quite uh, interesting that when Macron gave his speech at the Sorbonne, um, which was expected to be the great euro area reform speech, he only talked about the euro area at the very end of the speech. And as we found out, and my colleagues at, at other newspapers also found out, he, he had a conversation with Angela Merkel before, uh, before he gave the speech. And she told him, you know, be uh, better, don't talk a bit about it too much because we cannot agree to it. Um, what to expect um, within Germany? You now, there has been debate that um, will German policy, fiscal policy become a uh, loser now because of all the, the, the demands the parties um, have? Um, I don't think so. Um, we might see moderate tax cuts, moderate spending increases, but not not uh, any form of massive um, fiscal loosening. Why? It's just because fiscal um, stability is just so deeply entrenched in Germany. It's the cross-party consensus um, that we don't want to do this. Um, by the way, it's it's also sometimes misleading that uh, you know Dr. Schäuble and the great austerity uh, regime. The German German fiscal stance has been moderately expansionary in recent years. So. This might continue, but nothing, uh, nothing dramatically. Also, there are institutional obstacles. Um, it has been mentioned there's a debt break in the constitution, and it's quite difficult, even if you wanted to increase that massively, it's quite difficult to, um, to achieve that. So the question then is, can we live with it? And yeah, I'm very much with, uh, with Daniel Gross. Yes, I would say yes, the upswing is, uh, is, is, um, is robust. Um, the European Central Bank will be in the debt markets for many, many years now, even if QE ends now, because of the reinvestment of what they bought, what they have in their balance sheet, um, it will be there for a long time controlling yields. So don't see um, any problem there. 
And also a uh, development that is rarely reported is that you know, debt to GDP ratios and non-performing loans, the big problems uh, we had in the crisis, are actually declining. Uh, it's with every upswing, you know, the bad stuff goes away if the economy is doing, economy is doing well. And um, that's what we are seeing at the moment. This is just quickly uh, difficult to read, but that's the Commission's uh, data on debt to GDP ratio. And you see, actually, it's not declining dramatically, but it is the direction is right. They are declining. Um, so, Italy talk about this later. So, my last slide um, what are the risks to this uh, development? Uh, I think politically, one um, the main risks are hiccups somewhere, you know, in Italy. Uh, we have elections there. We might also have a failure to produce, produce a stable government in Germany. Um, I'm not 100% sure that this coalition will work out. There might be new elections, so it could become nasty. It's not my main scenario, but it can happen. Um, and you, you also have to say, I'll also say, I'll also say there's also the risk that not only is there no movement in uh, euro area reform, but there's actually backtracking. So there is a risk that the FDP insists on uh, the more radical elements of its platform. For instance, it calls for ending the, uh, the ESM, so that would be really dramatic. Don't see it's, li it's highly likely, but it can happen. And um, the third and last uh, risk is we will have a leadership change at the helm of the ECB um, in 2019. And if some crazy guy you know, became the new president or woman, uh, this might be bad. Um, the most likely candidate at the, at the moment is Jens Weidmann. And I know he's not a, he's not, doesn't have the best reputation uh, brought, but I think he's in, in, in the deep of his heart, he's a pragmatic, uh, pr pr pragmatic central banker. So that, that, I wouldn't see that as, uh, as a risk. Thank you. Well, we've had four very stimulating <coughs> presentations and, um, uh, and a very disciplined uh, uh, panelists who've uh, stayed within time, so we have time. I think what I'll do is I'll collect some comments, questions, two or three at a time. And uh, I've been asked, and quite reasonably, to start uh, with s students, if there are any students in the room who have questions. That, that doesn't include students of life. <laughs> All right, so we'll take uh, graduates. Uh, yes, uh, you should identify yourself. Yeah, I'm uh, Rich Rosen. Uh, I work on climate change issues, but uh, I also work on some economic issues. And so two comments particularly devoted to the first two speakers. Um, I'm afraid I have to be highly critical of your talks in that I don't think either of you mentioned income inequality and its implications for your analyses. Um, it's sort of like hearing Janet Yellen say the labor market in the U.S. is fine. Well, it's not fine. Um, you know, white males are being paid less now than they were 40 years ago, et cetera. So without looking at income inequality, both transnationally and within nations, I, no one cares about GDP anymore. It's an archaic concept in my view. You have to look at who's benefiting. So when you answer the question, is the European economy out of the woods, you know, for who? is always the question, particularly now. And the second uh, area I'd say in terms of investment particularly is again, you, you didn't mention the need for the world and for Europe to deal with climate change. Okay, you know, most numbers, and I think these are maybe even too low, is that each country needs to spend 10% of GDP per year to mitigate climate change. And so when you talk about an investment gap, okay, and you know, Maybe there's none in terms of the traditional structure of the economy, but in terms of what's needed, there's a huge investment uh, shortage in terms of dealing with climate change, renovating housing, you know, building renewable energy, et cetera, and, and that wasn't mentioned either. Okay, thanks. Uh, let's take at least one more and then um, turn back to the panel. I, I have uh, Sebastian Royal uh, is next. Sebastian Royal from Suffolk University. So a couple of you mentioned the European Central Bank and it has started the process to easen up on the emergency steps that it took during the crisis. And when you look at what is happening in Europe with the weaknesses in Italian banks, the risk of a potential strengthening of the euro that is going to hurt um, exports in some countries, there are also bubbles in the, in the real estate sector in countries like Germany. So this easing of the uh, emergency steps would likely have some negative impact. And I'm wondering if you can comment on what you expect from that. Okay, and, and let's take one more if you can take a note of these. And uh, Elizabeth Sherwood, right now. Thanks, Peter. I have a question for Daniel. Uh, on his uh, 
optimism about uh, the economies of Europe and, and the point you've made about Europe working again. How do you factor in immigrant populations into your data? Where are the numbers associated with the mass influx of immigrants in various countries and whether they are being employed in, in what way? Okay, so let me turn back to the panel. I, um, I'll start with Agnes and Daniel since they were uh, most directly, but I'll ask if um, uh, either anybody else has comments, feel free. Okay, thank you for the, for the comments. Um, on income inequality, you're right. Uh, I think there is something that needs to be uh, thought about. In Europe, there is this principle of subsidiarity. So uh, it is the task of the EU to sign uh, trade agreements with China and to promote uh, competition within the EU. Uh, but that is, it is the task of the governments, uh, national governments, to take care of the losers. And uh, actually, the, they don't perform very well uh, on this, although it's a little better than uh, in uh, the US and uh, also in the, than in the UK. Uh, and I think uh, um, in the perspective of the new uh, budget, the new EU budget that is going to be discussed, uh, it will start in 2021, but it needs to be discussed well in advance because it's going to be uh, extremely long. Uh, we, we need to rethink about that, whether uh, the EU would not need to be involved in some, some kind of compensation of the losers, have to retrain. Uh, for instance, you could imagine some, uh, some um, plans uh, in coordination with local authorities uh, when you have a, an area which is really distressed and uh, say a five-year um, window where you have investment in this uh, area. And then maybe it will fail, but at least you, you have, try, have tried to do something. So uh, I think the new budget would need to be much more contingent uh, to, to events. And it also has to do with refugees, could have to do with hurricanes somewhere. Can, so more contingent, less uh, of, uh, of transfers that uh, are decided seven years in advance. Um, and also, um, where the, the, the French president has, has tried to promote the idea of having more competition between companies and between uh, workers, but less between governments, having more tax coordination, more social coordination. And it has also to do with, it's not only inequalities, it's also the perception of inequalities, which is something different from inequalities, and which needs to be taken into account when uh, designing the policies. So uh, here, there, there, some, some, something could, could be done, but uh, immediately, uh, the response of the other countries was, oh, he's protectionist. So this is the, 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 the reaction. So it's, it's, a, it's a free trade uh, area. On climate change, um, I think uh, we have a problem with the carbon market, the carbon emission market. Uh, and uh, as economists, we have a responsibility, having promoted this solution uh, for, for, meeting, for reducing uh, uh, carbon emissions, whereas now I think uh, having taxes is considered as more reliable because uh, in terms of political economy, uh, when you have a crisis, then the, the price of carbon emissions is uh, close to zero, and then uh, how are you going to uh, incentivize uh, industries and households to, to make the investments? So, so we, we are still in this uh, problem. Bubbles in, in Germany and monetary policy, I think we, one, one good outcome of the crisis was the rediscovering of uh, so-called macroprudential policies. So the idea is that if you have a, a housing bubble in Germany, it's not the task of the ECB uh, to take care of it. You have uh, tools uh, in Germany, uh, loan to value ratios, uh, caps on uh, credit growth, and things like that, uh, that can be, uh, can be used. Uh, and finally, uh, immigration, immigration in the EU has been very unequal. Some countries have received the, the bulk of it. So a positive uh, outcome in the short term is a slight demand boom in Germany. Uh, re in relation with uh, the refugees, because you have to build a housing, you have to uh, spend money in uh, in training and so on, and so there's a slight. I think there's a slight uh, um, public demand boom uh, related to, to to the to the immigrant. But I know I know that in the long ter in the long term, this is a big issue because uh, immigration uh, is going to continue from Africa, uh, even without. Uh, a war in, in Syria, there's going to be a flow from Africa. And, um, and I, I don't see this flow uh, coming down in, in the near future. OK, thank you. OK, a couple of comments. 
I, I disagree on fundamentally on the premise of the question on inequality. The premise is that inequality is going up everywhere. And if you look at the numbers, you get a very differentiated picture. Within the EU across countries, you see a textbook convergence east-west, and you see some slight divergence north-south within the euro area. Right? So it is very mixed. And the north-south, we don't know whether it was once off because of the financial crisis, or that only future will tell. But as I said, across countries, no evidence that there's an increase in inequality generalized in Europe. Within countries, it is very similar. You have some countries where some indicators point to more inequality, others where it's the other way around. And if you pick carefully, you can, of course, have all countries going up. But every country presents you with many different indicators. Even for Germany, if you take the Gini coefficient after taxes, the interesting thing is it had increased until 2005 and stopped increase, increasing after the reforms, uh, the hard reforms, which were supposed to be so antisocial. And so it's a very differentiated picture. And the premise that as a generalized increase in inequality in all European countries is just not true. I leave investment to, uh, in, uh, to, uh, to Agnes. Um, um, on the central bank, um, I don't understand all this attention paid to the ECB. Europe is an area with a very large domestic savings surplus. And that's why we are having very low interest rates, almost regardless of what the ECB is doing. Take Germany with a current account surplus of 6% or 9% of GDP, of GDP, savings rate of 24%. <coughs> so more than one third of every euro saved has to be exported. I, I don't see how interest rates can really be increased in the euro area almost regardless. Anyway, we know how much the ECB can buy before it hits its own limits. And whether it buys them over 12 months at a high rate or 24 months at a low rate, financial markets know that. So I don't think uh, there's any, any financial turbulence to expect it when the ECB stops its program because everybody knows at what point they have to stop. And uh, perhaps let me finish on the refugees. Um, they are a really very small part of the labor force. Actually, they're not yet part of the labor force. They're part of the population. But even so, there, there was a once-off 1.5 million on a population of 300 million, once-off. And then the other years, it's, it's not even half of that number for the entire euro area. As Agnes said, very differentially distributed. Even for Germany, I think Mark might comment on that. The rule of thumb is that for refugees, not for other immigrants, we have a very high rate of working immigration into Germany right now, actually as high as that of the United States. People coming from Greece, from Spain, from, from all over the world, actually. In that sense, Germany has become very similar to the United States. But there's this other part, the one stock which came 1.5, let's say 1.2 million. Um, and for those, for refugees, the rule of thumb is that 10% join the labor force each year. First year, 10%, second year. And after five years, you have 50%. And after 10 years, they're like the locals. And that's what you see right now. So you can say very slow integration or normal integration, right? But um, two years after, we have 20% of them in the labor force. And the prediction is next year will be 30, 40. So that is a process which seems to be going on normally. Um, but it doesn't really change the nature of the European labor market. It does not, because the numbers are just not there. No. One stock you know, at one point in time, which might have an impact on the German labor market, but the flows, and here I disagree with and yes, the flows looking for, going forward will be below, I would say, one-tenth of one percent of the population. talking about Italy. Again, <laughs> right? We have seen, actually, that we have a European labor market. We're beginning to have one, and things are being distributed. Thank you very much. Uh, you need not, don't feel you have to respond, but do either of you want to say anything? Yeah, just um, on the on the housing uh, bubbles, as someone who just recently bought a flat in Berlin, I'm just, I'm strictly against the notion of there being a housing bubble. <laughs> and but <laughs> um, 
There, there, because uh, Daniel mentioned the, the question, why, uh, why isn't housing picking up as strongly in Germany as it has in, in other co European countries? And I think it has to do with some um, peculiarities in the German um, financial system. So uh, access to finance is a major issue. It's not as easy if you're a low-income household to, uh, to get a loan at your, at your bank because you need a high deposit and so on and so on. So it's much, it's much, much more difficult. Rules are much stricter, which maybe uh, prevents somehow the strong increase in, uh, in housing demand. And there are also issues on the uh, administrative side. So it takes this being Germany, you know, the long process of planning and uh, administrative uh, issues before you can start building. And there's also a scarcity in the market. So at the moment, if you wanted to buy a house, you'd have difficulties find, uh, finding um, firms which I find interesting because you would assume that this being a European labor market, that there would be just more craftspeople from you know, all over Europe coming to Germany, Spain, Poland, uh, Portugal. Uh, that's not happening. So uh, that is They also don't constraint. have the German qualifications, right? Yeah, right. That's one, one of the problems. But, and also, just sorry, but this one word on GDP. You know, I, you know, ideologically, I'd be with you, but coming from a country which was in a deep crisis, and now it's not, no longer, I can tell you that it makes a hell of a difference whether GDP increases or not. I mean, it, people get jobs, people get income. So it might not be the best indicator we have, but it certainly is an indicator for well-being in, 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 in a country. Okay, well, we have time for one or two more rounds. I, I think you had a question there. And, <coughs> yeah. Um, yes. Um, yeah. Oh, um, okay. I was thinking um, of your neighbor, but that's all right. Go ahead. Right. Yeah. yeah, identify yourself. We'll just, yeah. Um, yeah, thank you for the talks. I'm Katja Mulling from Modern University and currently a visiting fellow. Um, two things. First of all, I would like to share this really optimistic outlook that you were giving. Um, also, we heard about youth unemployment in Greece, and I would also extend this to other countries in terms of maybe we have high employment rates, but younger people are confronted with fixed term contracts and a lot of insecurity, which also leads to low birth rates and things you mentioned. And I think to experience this at the beginning of the two years is especially severe because it, it kind of, from a life course perspective, it, it will translate to the further career. So I think um, even though we might be optimistic on, un uh, on employment growth, I think especially the problem that younger people are experiencing insecurity, this leads me to the assumption that we might not be that optimistic, actually. And maybe you could comment on this. Then a second comment on the rise in employment rates. Um, I think a huge part of this has been actually the rise in female employment. So we also have to think about maybe it's not only the economic recovery, but also the <coughs> family policy, which is actually important in having a high employment rate. So um, how do you view this kind of importance of other uh, domains in, in policy, like family policy, institutions, and so on, uh, in comparison to economic policy and economic recovery? Thank you. Can I just ask, are, are people able to hear, generally speaking? Yes. Good, yes. excellent. So we'll just go there. There's a troika there. We'll just go to the troika. <laughs> we'll go to your neighbor and then to the Vivian Schmidt. So thank you so much. I just have, it actually follows some of the questions that Katya asked. So my name is Ivan Istavovic, and I'm a visiting scholar here. Um, so I would like to go back to two questions, maybe in equality, but differently um, asked. One is the really the concern of in work, rising in work poverty. And I'm thinking here about the recent Eurofund study from September 2017. Um, the European Commission mentioned uh, in her, uh, in its reflections on um, um, the social dimension of the EU that there are there is um, around one quarter of EU population that is at risk of in work poverty. And the second connection question is, I can, I can send you the uh, reflection paper. Um, and the second question, uh, in the second uh, 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 linked phenomenon is the growth, as Katya mentioned, of precarious work. Um, and so I was wondering, uh, maybe the, uh, the employment rate uh, is high, and maybe we are doing better than the United States. But definitely, the figures do not necessarily reflect the experiences of workers. And I was wondering, how do you factor that into your analysis? Do you come across these issues? Is it of relevance for you when thinking about the polit uh, political and economic future of Europe? OK, thank you. And, and we'll add uh, Vivian Schmidt to that. Yes, uh, thank you. I very much enjoyed um, your comments. Or actually, I didn't enjoy them. They made me very, very <laughs> uneasy. Um, and not only about on the labor issues, but 
more specifically so on yes I mean I think you you suggested that the European semester rules should be streamlined um, but you also started out with, <coughs> with a description of the problems with the pro-cyclical policies before and my question would be to what extent are some elements of the pro-cyclical mentality still in these rules and then whether or not whether they are or not um, they don't work uh, and I think there's a SEPS study that suggests that implementation uh, is full implementation is no more than seven to ten percent etc so you know so I so bracket that I think so one is the problem with the rules which look hierarchical top-down leads to questions of politics but then uh, moving on to Danielle Rose um, comments that it seems it, it, it seems to me that you were suggesting since everything is so positive we don't really need the Juncker fund or more investment um, things are moving forward so you know ending with with Mark's comments that you can either go centralized or decentralized into deeper integration or less uh, it seems to me that all of these comments suggest uh, and the reality suggests we're not going to get deeper integration so we're left with rules it seems to me without the kind of solidarity necessary um, to counter the kind of rising euro skepticism that we see in an extreme way in Greece but we also see uh, across Europe so I end with Macron what happens when Macron doesn't get what he needs in terms of changes in the eurozone um, Five years hence, where are we? All right. Well, that um, on that optimistic <laughs> note, uh, I guess we'll start with you again. To, to Thank this you. Um, so, on an employment rate, uh, I think one may, one big reason for the increase in employment rates is the. Um, the senior uh, workers and the effect of pension reforms. And I agree that this gives uh, faith in uh, in uh, policy in policies in general because you can have an impact on the employment rates and pension reform has an impact on employment rates and uh, so this is something difficult to understand to, to explain to the people because you, at the same time you have an increase in the employment rate and an increase in the unemployment rate uh, of the senior because they are back to they are in the in the labor force so some of them become unemployed whereas before they were not unemployed so uh, about uh, poverty in work poverty uh, so here I talk about uh, France because I'm not so sure I, I, I don't know much about the, the other countries. Um, the poverty rate in France is uh, quite low. It's 14%. Uh, well, it's always, always too high, but it's quite low compared to other countries. Uh, the Netherlands is uh, lower, but actually Germany is higher and it has been increasing. Um, also, the, the Gini and the poverty rate are two, two different yeah, measures. Gini, yeah. 28, I'm talking about that the poverty rate. Uh, um, there is no in-work poverty in France. Uh, poverty is completely related with the lack of work because of the minimum wage. The minimum wage is uh, quite high, so the, pover the poverty comes from uh, uh, part-time jobs or, or no job at all. So this is completely related, uh, with, uh, with a few exceptions related to um, single-parent uh, families where you have poverty and work at the same time. About precarious work, um, <laughs> The stock of precarious work in France is stable. It's about 11%. What, what, is, what has changed is that the, the, the precarity has increased. So the, the contracts are shorter and shorter, but it's the same people. <laughs> so the stock is the same. So you cannot say that it's an explosion of, pre, of precarious work. It's just that it's an explosion of duality, with those precarious being more precarious and the other ones fine. Um, about uh, procyclicality, uh, and uh, so you know, I understand why you are uneasy. I'm un I was actually I'm quite uneasy with the idea that there is a recovery, everything is going to be fine, and we we don't need uh, reforms any longer. I think new reforms are needed in the up up uh, upwing uh, upswing of the of the economy. And uh, if I can also uh, say, I'm uneasy also with the idea of uh, relying on market discipline. Uh, nobody talks about the Asian crisis. Um, the market was not especially brilliant in, uh, in uh, uh, forecasting the Asian crisis. So are we going to put our faith on, on the, the on market discipline? I am quite, um, 
uh, uneasy with this idea. Now, coming back to the procyclicality, procyclicality uh, of fiscal policy is something very widespread. So even in countries without uh, these rules, you can find procyclicality. It's, it's political economy. In an, when you have uh, a demand boom, when you have a GDP boom, you have more uh, tax receipts and you, there's a tendency to, to distribute them. So, um, so it's not just the euro area, however, it tends to say, to say that we should rely more on automatic stabilizers, less on discretionary fiscal policy, especially when we think about something at the euro area level. Uh, and uh, what I try to say uh, in streamlining the European semester is uh, that uh, the European semester, come, uh, you have country-specific recommendations that, that are different in, in different areas. So you are going to repeat every year to Italy that they should reform the innovation system, that we should reform the justice, and it doesn't make sense vis-a-vis -vis the stability of the euro area itself. So the EU, for the euro area stability, it's much more in terms of uh, cost divergence in terms of uh, credit booms, so it has to do with macroprudential policies, which are a different process, not incorporated in the European uh, semester. So it's kind of mismatch between the objectives and the instruments. I think we have the instruments. I think we have the objectives. It's just that they are not in line. <laughs> There's a mismatch. <laughs> we, we, we put the instruments for the wrong objectives and vice versa, in a sense, in a sense. And uh, there is a, a big debate with Germany about the current account, um, because a very high current account. In Germany, uh, there is this opinion that a very high current account proves that the country is highly competitive. And uh, co for an economist, competitiveness has to do with market shares, not with the current account. Current account surplus means that there is excess uh, supply, and so there is a, uh, a shortage of demand. Thank you. I might also be uneasy with the idea that you can have a recovery without reforms, but I think we talked earlier about facts, and the facts are there that there is a recovery. Um, we can always have doubts that it will continue, but as I said, all the basic ingredients are there for it to continue. So let's just recognize the facts. On labor force, on the uh, aging, most of the uh, increase in the actual labor force participation rate, you can explain with one variable, education. Mm. Because the levels of education in Europe have increased trend-wise everywhere, comma, and in particularly in the South among the females. And in particular among the elderly, the, the elderly which uh, became old, so to speak, 10 years ago, had a very low level of education. The elderly should become now 55 to 65, they have a much higher level of education and therefore they stay longer. Also because they had different jobs, less physical demanding because if you have a higher level of education, you typically have jobs, right? So that is part of a natural process. On top of that, uh, there might have been some pension reforms and so on, but the key driver uh, behind the higher, the trend-wise increase uh, in the um, labor force participation rate in Europe has been a higher level of education, and since that works itself through the system, it's continuing, it's likely to continue. And as I said, in the South, particularly among the females. On youth unemployment, I have to be a little bit uh, politically incorrect. And I use some numbers from Greece which are approximately right, perhaps not to the last. 66% youth unemployment rate in Greece. And when I looked at the numbers, that was for the 15 to 19 years old. You take, during that time, you took 100 Greek youth, right, 15 to 19 years. Nine of them were in the labor market. Six were, six were looking for a job, and three had a job. Unemployment rate of 66%. Six youth of 100 are unemployed. Right, so Absolutely. keep that in mind. It's true, right? Absolutely. So, uh, yes, because most of them are not in the labor market, comma, and most of them were not in the labor market even before the crisis, right? And this is all throughout Southern Europe where the unemployment rates among the youth are highly misleading. And therefore, I invite you not to repeat these, uh, these statements and to, to see them in a proper context. 
it is clear that it would be desirable to get Greek youth into the labor market and to do something, especially those who are neither in education nor training. All true, but this is not a cyclical problem. This is a structural problem which has existed beforehand. On the Juncker plan, I mean, sorry, if you have financial markets where interest rates are zero everywhere and where capital is desperately looking for an investment, and to say we need to have a public sector investment program, that doesn't make sense. In 2014, you could say there's some lingering effects of the financial crisis and some public sector invention is useful. But right now, um, you don't need a Juncker plan. You don't need an official EU investment plan because almost all investment can be financed by the private sector alone. Uh, I, the first uh, loan given by the Juncker plan, which I saw, was to support uh, startups in Bavaria. Okay, I mean, if there's one area <laughs> in the world <coughs> where there's really enough capital, <laughs> why do we need to support the EU to support that? that? I don't really see that. So I would say... Um, I think we have to look at this economy uh, with an objective eye, not saying it has to be bad because otherwise we don't get our euro area reform. The point is, unfortunately, this economy is doing quite well now with, of course, very large regional differences um, and it's likely to do quite well even in the absence of reforms. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kyriakos. I will begin by commenting on, uh, on that, on youth unemployment. This is exactly the reason why on our survey, we focused on those who are under 35 rather than in the 18 to 24 category because culturally that would be extremely misleading in Greece. And that's why you have this huge fluctuation from 60% to 40%, uh, which is in just, in just two years. Um, so uh, nonetheless, in those who are under 35 years old, the fact that the primary source of income is family uh, funds is still extremely problematic. Um, and the mix that I more or less tried to describe before, that those who are young in Greece are basically extremely poor, uh, basically unemployed, uh, they don't have enough children and they want to leave, this also creates a toxic mix vis-a-vis -vis political uh, radicalization. Um, I was recently in a discussion with the former head of YouGov uh, in, in Greece, where he was speaking about the British referendum while I was speaking about the Greek referendum. Um, and in his analysis, the funny thing is that the, the vast majority of those in the 18 to 24 category voted for remain. In the Greek case, the, those who voted yes in the Greek referendum were basically the pensioners uh, rather than the young. So it's exactly, this, it's exactly the inverse picture. And most of the new jobs uh, that we're seeing uh, you know, created in Greece right now, they are precarious, basically. They're not uh, sustainable uh, in the long run. So, this interests us, uh, and we feel that uh, we're not going to stay only in the diagnosis. We feel that there are things that could be done vis-a-vis -vis family policy, social policy, etc. But there are many, and they're not happening as quickly as they should. Yeah, I'm, I'm really grateful for this question because I think it goes to the heart of the matter. More solidarity. Uh, uh, to me, solidarity is a very shy animal. Um, so what, what would happen if we increase transfers, say, from Germany and Netherlands to Greece and mm -hmm. Italy? Of course, the Italians and the, and, and, the, and the Greeks would be happy, but the Germans and the, and, and the Dutch would not be at all. So I, I'm not so sure whether more solidarity really increases you know, the pro-European sentiment in the euro area. It could be, but it could also have the opposite effect. And related to this, uh, this decentralized option, which I personally have become more and more um, uh, uh, sympathetic with, is because if you look at the alternative, which is you know, a centralized quasi-state, this would mean that um, the French legislature would have to accept if the commission rules on a certain budget item. Because if you want to have central, central, um, a central budget, you need to have central control of the finances. And I'm not so sure if the political con conflicts that will necessarily emanate from this um, mm -hmm. are so much better than having the market, <coughs> which is also not always right, but maybe easier to correct you know, than having a major conflict between, say, France and Brussels or Germany and Brussels or Germany and France because you have this, because you have this, uh, this, this transfer of competences. I mean, after all, the euro area is, not, is still um, a, a, a creature of sovereign states or quasi-sovereign states. So it's not that they easily just, um, you know, give up their competencies. So that's why I think this decentralized <coughs> thing is definitely worth looking at more closely. Great. Uh, uh, thank you very much. I think uh, we are out of time. And uh, as I'm being... Oh. I just have the last word. Yes, okay. yes, before, please. Before you conclude, um, I want to thank our panelists, and I want to thank all of you for coming. I hope that you'll continue to 
follow the rest of the proceedings today. Um, if you have a confirmation for participation in the lunch at the faculty club, I would ask if everyone could proceed there quickly. It will start at 12.30. Um, for those of you that were did not receive a confirmation, we hope that you will still follow. We are providing lunch upstairs and a live stream where you can follow uh, throughout lunch and then rejoin us for the afternoon all right, well, let me also thank our panelists. This was really very good.